Um, yeah, as already told, I'm Thomas Böhler. I'm a researcher at the at Constance University. Um, and initially, I was doing a lot of research on social networks. And then from social networks, I did a study where I had the social networks and the uh, place of living of all the students in the class where I measured the social network and then I wanted to see uh, whether it's more likely that there are friendships for students who live clo close to each other. So from social networks I quickly came to spatial analysis um, and it's more similar than you think. So the, the fields of social networks and the fields of spatial analysis um, like the methods are pretty similar because you analyze like two-dimensional data so and this is like the difficult thing when you analyze spatial data um, and another topic that uh, I'm interested is, in is uh, like integration of migrants but um, that's probably not something that we will touch on in this workshop um, okay the agenda for the first uh, hour or two hours uh, is that I first will say something about the program of the workshop uh, then I will talk about space as an import I think a very important category in the social sciences a lot of research questions that we have somehow relate to space um, I will sketch some problems uh, with the like traditional analysis um, of uh, these research questions that somehow relate to space um, and then we come to I write here brave new world of spatial data because like increasingly with smartphones and Google and um, other kind of companies that analyze uh, the locations of people and uh, businesses and so on there's a lot of data available um, and this can be scary yeah, because Big Brother is watching you and uh, Google knows everything about you um, or Apple um, but on the other hand as social scientists we might be able to use this data to answer like old questions with better data and like maybe ask new questions uh, about society um, yeah these are the potentials and I, I will say something about the software and then be like the lectures are always that we that I I talk and talk and talk and you might uh, pose some questions and then we have like in the second part of the lecture then you should do something on your own and we start with the uh, GIS program Q uh, geographical information system and then you can work a bit on your own and um, I will walk around and help you uh, because I think. Uh, it's always better to do something actively with the computer program and not only to listen passively because then otherwise you can't replicate it in a week. Um, okay, the agenda is like, I mean, there are roughly three parts. Uh, in this agenda, uh, in the program for the workshop, it's not really like, it's not one part each day, but it's more like we have to handle it more flexibly. But it's first part is like what's spatial, spatial data and how can you present data so the first part is like is like sketching maps basically so it's more about vis visualization uh, of, of spatial data and probably a lot of you can when you have a research question uh, relating to space and um, you write a report and then you uh, present it uh, on a map that's always handy and uh, it's something I think a lot of researchers, even qualitative researchers, can use. And uh, the, the second and third part is more than about the analysis of spatial data and um, I think there are two uh, parts important. One is with uh, the spatial data that we gather from internet or other sources, we can uh, we can construct new variables, we can, we can get new information and relate this to the individual data that we, uh, that we analyze anyways. 
And the second thing is really the analysis of spatial patterns and uh, spatial regressions and so on. So these are the three parts. Um, and, yeah, and this roughly relates to, uh, to the um, seven sessions that I sketched here. And um, yeah, as Rukula already said, next week we can have like discussions about your own research and I might have some ideas and uh, maybe you, you find something very interesting and then we have to go more in detail. Uh, but that's something we have to see in the next three days. So, um, because this is only three days and not three months, we, there's a lot of topics that I only uh, touch on and then uh, we'll have to discuss whether we go into detail more on this topic or more on this topic. So, I'm kind of hoping that you are signaling me what interests you and what interests you not so much, so that we can have a good seminar. Um, yeah, you have it already, I guess, the, the program of the workshop. I will um, give you all the slides afterwards, so you don't have to write everything down. Um, you can focus more like on the practical stuff and maybe write down some things that you want to know more about or that you don't understand or some things that I say that are not on the slides. Are there any questions like in the beginning? No. So ask anytime there is a question, just ask me. Um, okay, I will start uh, with with uh, a map that you have probably seen before. <coughs> that's kind of the, historically, that's the start of spatial analysis. Um, you may have seen the, the, the famous ghost map. Um, it was drawn by uh, John Snow, uh, a medical doctor in London in uh, the 19th century. And um, at this time, uh, people didn't know much about um, how some diseases come about and uh, what's like the, the reason for some diseases. So there was a chol cholera epidemia in uh, London at the time and people did, didn't know what causes cholera and when you don't know what causes cholera you can't uh, do something against it. And um, at the time people thought uh, it kind of transmits through the air, and now we know uh, otherwise, but people didn't know. And what he, what he did, John Snow, um, is he, he painted all the uh, deaths of cholera in, in a map. So each dot on this map corresponds to one death of, of cholera, uh, so the place of living. Uh, yeah. And what he, what he did as well is he marked all the water pumps in this neighborhood. And um, as you can see, uh, most of the <coughs> cholera deaths um, are kind of scattered around this one water pump in the middle. So he con concluded that, he didn't know why, but he concluded that water supply and cholera has something uh, to do with each other and they sealed this water pump and they could stop like uh, the outbreak of cholera in this neighborhood. So this is kind of the first real spatial analysis. You see it's more like, it's not really de deductive and uh, statistical, it's more like visual inspection, but um, it, it's already, uh, it was really successful and uh, it already contains a lot of the things that we do now in when we analyze spatial data. So we have, we have kind of spatial locations, we have a map, and we have two different, um, we have a bivariate analysis, kind of, uh, two different factors. One is cholera deaths and one is water pumps in this. Uh, yeah. And now you could do it all with statistical analysis, but probably you don't have to. Um, but of course, this is not really social science. This is uh, kind of biology, a study in biology, and uh, a lot of uh, spatial analyses now are in epidemiology and uh, and related fields, and of course in political science. 
uh, and not so much in sociology. But in sociology, a lot of research that we do as also relates to space. And uh, these are only a few examples that we did on our own or that we um, that I find interesting. So I started my like my interest in spatial analysis started with these questions. Are students who live close to each other more likely to form friendships? Uh, so um, there's place of living is like a spatial uh, relevant category. Um, then a, a famous example is does the correlation between share of foreigners and voting share of far right parties? You know, there's, uh, there's uh, at least in Germany, but also I think in the U.S. There's this correlation that uh, when when people know not so many foreigners, they tend to be more against foreigners, strangely. And uh, there is this uh, analysis in Germany that, uh, that um, the spatial analysis in Germany, where they show that this relationship is not like this in all parts of the country. So uh, this kind of, a, uh, if you wish, there is a kind of a spatial interaction effect. So it's conditional on where people live. Uh, whether this uh, correlation holds or does not hold. Um, residential, residential segregation is another topic in sociology, a very like, classical uh, topic in sociology, like do different groups uh, live uh, more concentrated in different areas of cities. Um, then there are studies about um, social inequality with regard to the place of living. So there are quite famous studies in the US um, uh, showing that there is more pollution in areas where poor people live or black people live. And uh, that's because of yeah, people, in richer people have like they are more able to utilize like political uh, instruments to to get um, the cars out of the neighborhood and uh, the, the, the the factories um, that are that pollute, pollute the air, um, shut and so on. And um, yeah, in demography, for example, with fertility, there is also a lot of studies uh, about regional variation and why this could be. Um, Neighborhoods effect, neighborhood effects are an, uh, another topic in sociology that's very important, like uh, the place of living, the neighborhood that you live has effect, that they show that this has an effect on school performance and health and a lot of other things and I mean that's, that's because of different schools and different populations and probably also different pollution. So the, the, the mechanisms are not always that clear, but clearly sociologists have a lot of questions about space. Uh, a recent study that I think is really interesting uh, in, I think, the American Journal of Sociology, and probably you have read it, um, is that uh, is a study about conflict in New York, New York City, and they recorded like all the calls to the police and they recorded the, the location of the incident and uh, usually, like traditionally, you had um, neighborhood analysis and said, you said, okay, this is a poor neighborhood, there are a lot of incidents where people uh, call the police um, and this is a more affluent neighborhood and there are not so many incidents uh, with the police and um, they showed with this geocoded data where they had the exact location of the incident, they showed that the incidents happen mostly like on the on the borders of the neighborhoods. So when there's a rich neighborhood and a poor neighborhood, it does not happen like within the poor neighborhood, but on the borders between the rich and the poor neighborhood. And this is a kind of analysis that was not possible before. So before you could geocode all this data and you had the big data and so on. And uh, so I think this is a good, good example for new possibilities and uh, possibilities to ask new questions or maybe better questions. Um, 
Yeah, so now these are some random examples that I came across myself or like in the literature. Um, now I would be pro I would be interested like has any one of you research questions that have kind of a spatial component? From you I know already you are studying like mobility roughly and how this changes um, the city life. <clears throat> mobility um, and migration, how it influences the life of uh, big cities, like um, in my case it's Kiev. Yeah. So. <clears throat> and you have also a perspe perspective on, on different re like aerial units, like this voting districts and, and all yeah, these changes. Yeah, uh, that different districts, they have a uh, different... Uh, um, they have, I mean, the population of these di districts, they have different views and uh, they have, uh, they vote differently, uh, they have uh, different uh, cultural characteristics, uh, so uh, I think it would be nice to show it on the map, just yeah. to like, see. Yeah, or, or yeah. even to analyze whether like districts who are close to each other have different characteristics. So there, there would be a lot of potential in this perspective, I guess. So has anyone any research questions or that kind of relate to space? Well, just about uh, uh, I'm starting a research on uh, like historical sociology. Uh, with time series uh, data on prices from different locations in the 18th century Ukraine. And uh, I have uh, many research questions which are related to space, in, in particular the relationship between these places, if there, if there is any kind of uh, uh, influence, uh, uh, how price shocks uh, spread over oh, wow. space, and uh, well, what uh, kind of uh, <coughs> Uh, time lag separates these uh, yeah. places, um, but uh, so far I'm collecting data. Yeah. Uh, 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 by now I uh, have sufficient uh, data set to, to analyze, but uh, uh, I'm working to uh, make it even bigger. But I have it and I'm ready to, <laughs> to start this kind of Yeah, very research. interesting. I mean, all the research that is kind of, I mean, now these are two research questions that have like really a substantial interest in spatial processes but also like when you have when you do research on Ukraine or on Kiev then you have a spatial component because then you could kind of compare it to a different place and then you could ask is is space somehow important or is it not important when it's not important then okay then it's it's not in your research but you should go you could ask about space all, always anyone else yeah, maybe uh, this uh, this workshop will inspire you to <laughs> have new, um, new questions um, so when we think about space, then we can we can ask why why are why are the social scientists like interested in space at all? So what's what's the mechanism? We always uh, probably think okay, we have actors and uh, actors have interests and, um, and, uh, and in a society people interact with each other. But um, so where does space come into all this like what's the mechanism that space influences social actions and social patterns and so on what do you think like what, what do you think how how does it how does space come into well in my analysis um at that time, uh, there was a transformation related to the growing efficiency of uh, administration. And mm -hmm. my assumption is that with time, uh, there was a declining dependence uh, of the uh, 
price balance mm -hmm. on uh, geographical space. Okay. Because uh, because of improvements in transportation, in road system, and also because of um, uh, establishment of new hierarchies between cities uh, due to new administrative division. Mm -hmm. So my assumption is that uh, uh, the patterns of spread of price shocks were changing uh, due to all these changes that I have mentioned. Okay, but so your your first assumption is that like. Through sheer distance, mm -hmm. uh, space plays a role. So yes. So there is one place and there is another place, and it needs time to for transportation or a spread of information between uh, one place and the other place. And this, of course, changes with transportation and so on. And uh, the second assumption that you have is that space plays a role through institutions. So there's probably different institutions in different places. So this is something you could, there you don't have to have a continuous like space, but you have like discrete points and discrete places have different uh, infrastructure or different institutions. So this is probably uh, two assumptions you have about space. Are there any other possible mechanisms? Junior legend just looked at um, which uh, points uh, could be wrong. Cross chair collection. We have, I think, data from uh, 2012's election. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's, I think it's possible to check how that this process went. Okay. So. Of course, in different places, there are also different, like, there are different candidates, and then there are, there's different problems, probably, and there's different population, and uh, this is all different in different spaces, and so, I mean, different populations is more, there's, I think, the space, there's direct effects from space, like when you have different distances, and then you have space kind of as a, proxy for population or, or for other things mm -hmm. that kind of you can capture with space because you don't have like the, the oil because it captures what you want to say about this place um, but it's more indirect I, I would say so when you have a research question about space you should also or like when you have research questions and um, somehow you have different places then you could also uh, you could always ask yeah why does space have uh, have an influence in my case what's what's the mechanism behind and when like we touched about some of these things um, now uh, and this is no complete list but I think space can act as a framework or you could also say as a context for social action so this is kind of the uh, the place where the action uh, happens, uh, like through distance, through di different institutions, through different infrastructure, through the social context, like the social composition of the place, it's probably a bit related to your uh, question, uh, but also through the built environment, the architecture, like is the art architecture more the, of the, the layout of the streets, how is it uh, are people meeting each other because they, the, all the streets uh, lead to one big place or is it that people don't have to see their neighbors? And often space is also used as a proxy for differences in socialization or differences in lifestyle. And you think of uh, studies um, that um, compare like uh, rural and urban areas or when you like in Germany we have also like in all the studies we we control for Eastern and Western Germany and that's probably something you you can also or you do also in Ukraine between uh, Eastern and Western Ukraine and then you then you can ask what what does it stand for does it stand for different population or does it stand for uh, urban and rural, or does it stand for uh, Russian influence, or does it st stand for different socialization because of different school systems? So 
there's this is this is only a proxy this is only a sh shortcut for, for all these uh, different uh, different influences and most of the time this is perfectly fine so when you when you don't ask like more specific questions in this direction then you can just control for it and go go with your interest that, that you have anyway so uh, but sometimes it's more interesting to look on the on the executive like what's east and west and maybe there's something in between and maybe you have to uh, control for all the different districts or the the latitude and longitude and so on um, okay so this is more like more like a call to to you that you should think about what role does space play in your research question <coughs> So now coming to uh, analysis of data that, that we have, uh, like traditional analysis of data, statistical analysis of data, um, and problems with it, and where probably spatial analysis can play a role. So the first point that I want to make is that is this inclusion of spatial positions with independent variables. So this is just the, the, the example that I gave with East and West Germany, this is probably a bit rough. And what what does it say about people who live right next to the border uh, and they happen to be on the eastern side or the western side? Are they not more similar to their uh, to the other individuals that live like very close to them? Um, so this is something that you can improve on with. Uh, like more detailed spatial data. This is, for example, the, the example I gave from New York. When you have like the exact location, then you can kind of have a more detailed analysis. The second problem that um, you have with traditional analysis uh, of spatial data, um, you most often you do like multi-level analysis. So you have, for example, regions and then you have states uh, uh, nested in, within these regions and then you have observations nested within these states. Um, and when you think about it, when you, uh, and when you run multi-level models, this is a spatial analysis because you, this, the states or neighborhoods that you analyze you don't take into account the, the location of these neighborhoods. So you, you don't take into account that some neighborhoods are neighbors and some are not neighbors. So um, this is something, and sometimes this is very interesting. So a lot of research on neighborhood effects do, do like multi-level models, but they don't really account for the spatial structure of the data. And that's something we can improve on with spatial uh, analysis. Um, and the third, I have to say, problem with traditional analysis of spatial data is when you have, for example, when you analyze segregation, then you, you typically you take voting districts or um, some other form of uh, administ administrative units and you calculate, calculate whether there are a lot of people living in these units uh, of one group, for example, foreigners or poor people, and uh, there are not so many people living in a different district. Um, but you usually use like only administrative <coughs> data, so you use only the data that you have, and that can be pretty arbitrary. So. Um, the, some districts do not correspond, correspond to how people live or perceive their neighborhoods. And uh, with the spatial, I guess, with this and uh, all the spatial analysis, you can have a more flexible approach to, to this. You can have like individual neighborhoods and you can kind of form your own uh, neighborhoods based on different criteria. For this as well, um, you can have a look on this paper in the American Journal of Sociology, I think, 
Schaeffer is one author, uh, we can have a look later. Um, but they try to, to establish neighborhoods based on satellite data and, and uh, optical analysis of, of the picture. So it's, it's pretty cool what they do. <laughs> Uh, but you don't have to go as far as this. Uh, most of the time you do, or we do, studies on local constellations and there we have a lot of local knowledge and we can just correct for some things. Okay, um, now there are still problems with um, this new analysis of spatial, spatial data and I will uh, just briefly touch on it and then we come back to it later. Uh, one problem is the so-called modifiable aerial unit problem that there are scaling effects when you kind of form like aerial units, for example neighborhoods, um, then there's the question of scale, so how big do you, how big are your neighborhoods? And this is something you should probably answer theoretically. So, um, for some questions, small neighborhood is appropriate. For example, when you analyze social networks, then it's more important, like the daily contact with, with whom people come into contact. But for other, for other questions, probably a, a larger scale is more appropriate. Um, and of course, there are zoning effects. So, where do you, where is the border of this neighborhood? Uh, and this is sometimes not so easy uh, to to answer. Um, yeah, the the second thing that that's that's an that's an add-on to this problem in multi-level models that you have the so-called checkerboard problem then like when each box cor corresponds to a neighborhood, uh, then you need to kind of have measurements that take into account how these different neighborhoods are like related to each other. So when you have the traditional uh, segregation index and uh, you have neighborhoods where only blacks live and you have neighborhoods where only whites live, uh, you see black and white uh, boxes. Um, and when you, when you have a traditional uh, segregation index and you would calculate it with, uh, on these two pictures and these two constellations of neighborhoods, you would get the same, you would get, get the same value of the index. But of course, this is wrong because if, when you, and this is also a bit related to the scaling effects because when you have like not neighborhoods that are as small as the single boxes, but when you would define neighborhood, like only four neighborhoods in these cities, in these stylized cities, then you would kind of capture the segregation because then you would have in the one case, you'd have very, you'd have a mixed neighborhood, whereas in the other, uh, in the other case, you'd have a very segregated, uh, like a neighborhood that's only black. All right, and um, the third problem that you have, like when you analyze spatial data, is spatial autocorrelation. Um, so, usually, one of our assumptions is, with our regression, regression analysis is that uh, the observations are independent of each other. All right, but then you have a theoretically idea that there's somehow space is has an influence on the observations and then you'd have to say okay but then observations that are uh, spatial clo spatially close to each other have the same influence on each other so they are not really independent anymore so there's at least one component um, that's affecting both and that kind of violates the assumption of this OLS uh, regressions. But this is something you can easily adjust for. Uh, but when you have some kind of spatial process that you analyze, you, sh you should at least check for 
spatial autocorrelation. And then most of the time there's no spatial autocorrelation because we have like random samples and they are spread all over the country or a city so they, there is no spatial autocorrelation so you can go on with your the traditional OLS regression, but you can check it and you would and, uh, and we do it on the third day, you do it by uh, checking the residuals of the regression and you check whether there is spatial autocorrelation in, in the residuals and then you see whether you need some more sophisticated model. That's when you want to just, when you just want to control for um, spatial autocorrelation. Okay, but this uh, now took us very far in the course. So now I will show you some pictures. So uh, that we have a in the beginning and it's more probably more easy, not so statistical. So um, I want to highlight some new possibilities uh, that we have with spatial data. And uh, one new possibility um, is this. Maybe, maybe you know, can you guess what this is? Two plus seven segregation. It can be ant. Can be ant. Anything. <laughs> Anything. Yeah. Maybe I can zoom in a bit. Then maybe then you uh, can recognize it. Yeah, it's, it's a map. map. Yeah. Mm. This is New York. Yeah, this is, this is Manhattan. Yeah, you see, uh, this is Central Park here, and uh, this is an analysis of the census of the U.S. So each dot corresponds to I think one building uh -huh. or one block, like and, one block. and uh, the colors represent like the major the racial majority within mm -hmm. these blocks. And so uh, you see with this data, you see the uh, how, where people, where people live in the city, uh, in, in Manhattan or New York City. And uh, you see, uh, I'm, I don't know, I think this is Spanish Harlem, this is the, 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 the orange dots, and you see whites, and you see, I think this, this might be Chinatown, and um, this is the, the yeah, I, don't, I don't know, the blue are blacks, I think, and, um, <laughs> So you have a much more detailed, fine-grained picture of the city and segregation and so on. And um, this data is available, like the census data from the US is, uh, I think, available for everyone. And uh, it, I mean, with such high level of resolution? Yeah, I think so. I mean, this is just a picture from the internet, and this is no famous. This Eric Fisher is no famous. Researcher with uh, special <coughs> access to data, um, and um, yeah, so probably you have to have some kind of cooperation. I I don't know. I, I have not this data. We had uh, um, census data from Switzerland, mm -hmm. so we could plot all the inhabitants. Like I will show. I have a lot of examples from the study we did uh, in Constance and Constance and. Kreuzling. Kreuzling is like Constance, but in Switzerland, so it's the border town. And Constance, as you might know, uh, lies uh, on the border to Switzerland, and um, this is kind of one city, and, but it's two cities. Yeah. So, uh, and we had a lot of data in Switzerland, very interesting data. So one, one, one day, the, someone from the administration in Kreuzlingen, which is the town in Switzerland, he sent me an, uh, or maybe I shouldn't uh, tell this on the on the videotape. <laughs> <laughs> he sent me an Excel file, with very um, good data. <laughs> so okay, here we have all the inhabitants in Switzerland, and um, and we have uh, also some uh, information about them. And then there's the question: what what can you do with all this uh, with all this information? Um, increasingly, I mean, this is the German socioeconomic panel, you might have heard of it or not, uh, it's not that important, but um, a lot of data sets that, uh, the, of these big data sets, uh, get spatial, now have spatial information in it, uh, also uh, in the UK and in the US. 
and um, so there is no arbitrary aggregation on some uh, administrative units needed anymore, but you can increasingly have very fine-grained um, analysis. Um, with the problem that, of course, there needs to be more efforts to preserve anonymity because, um, of course, when you know where someone lives, then you know who, who this person is. So uh, this can be a problem. Yeah? But increasingly, in data sets, you find this uh, kind of context data. Um, yeah, it, you can get census data and uh, from Germany or from the US and probably from a lot of different other countries. That, that's the point. I don't know much about the data situation in the U Ukraine, but um, that's something we can probably talk later about. And I would be very interested in hearing about this. Probabilities. Uh, Eurostat has a lot of um, information um, about the EU states uh, and uh, the administrative units, uh, like the NAT, these administrative units in uh, Europe called NUTS. I don't know what it stands for, N U T S. And uh, there's different levels, NUTS 1, 2, 3, and I guess 4. And, uh, Euro study of um, information, context information, and all these on, on all these levels. But as you see, um, there's no Ukraine. So yet, I don't know what's the status uh, or what's the relationship between Ukraine and the EU at the moment. So it could be that uh, Eurostat will some some day <coughs> have some data about the Ukraine as well. Because they have about Turkey, and I guess Turkey and the Ukraine have, have a similar status uh, with regard to the EU. Um, a different topic that is gonna be huge, I think, and offers huge possibilities is like smartphones and uh, Google. So uh, you might know that uh, when you have an Android smartphone, you can. Uh, go back in time and uh, he shows you where you were uh, like one year ago. So uh, on February 2nd, I think now uh, this year, this is what I did. Yeah, I left the home at 9.30 and then I went to work and then I went uh, to have something to drink. <laughs> from yeah, And then I was home at 2 in the morning. So. That's, that's something Google knows about me and that's something Google knows about everyone and I think this, like in the, in the future, um, we could instead of that we pay interviewers to interview someone, we could just pay respondents to give us the smartphone data and then we could ask very interesting questions about mobility and, and so on. So a student of mine, for example, he uh, did an internship uh, with a huge market, marketing company in Germany and they bought they bought this uh, location data so on on uh, every Android smartphone there is some apps uh, pre-installed and these apps uh, they send all the location data uh, through the US and they aggregate it and they sell it back to marketing companies and they bought this uh, they bought this data and um, from the data they could analyze where people live because that's where they are usually at night and um, so they could analyze where people live and then they could analyze for, for different shops who had to buy for it who comes to their shops yeah? so they did not have to ask uh, people who come to the shop where do you live and uh, from this they could infer how many money they have and so on but they just like analyzed the data and this is kind of spooky because uh, like you could also do this in real time and then you come into a shop and the owner knows where you live basically yeah? so this is very spooky uh, on the one hand side but on the other hand side you could probably also use it for uh, analysis and social science uh, and we are always open to new, uh, to new questions. Um, 
a different, uh, a similar website, um, I think also based on uh, Google, is called Walkscore, and it gives you for all the all the locations a score that um, tells you how. how uh, it's called a walkability index. So uh, whether in this neighborhood you can do a lot of things by foot. Yeah? There are other schools and uh, shopping possibilities and so on within reach, and on, and maybe a park. And um, so this is Mannheim in Germany and it's called the Walker's Paradise. And um, because it has a score of 93 or every uh, all the infrastructure is easy, easily available. And uh, it's already be sh been shown that, that this kind of walkability score uh, corresponds to, for example, health of individuals. Because when you live in an area where there is a lot of, you can do a lot of walking and you do everything by foot, then you are more active uh, than someone who lives like on the outskirts and has to use the car for everything. So, um, this is probably an interesting um, variable in research, uh, the walkability score. And, but as before, you, you first have to check whether uh, the Google data is as good in Ukraine as it is in the US. In Germany, it's kind of a mixed picture. You can use it, but it's not perfect. It's probably, it's, it's always, like with Google, it's always first perfect in, in the US and then you have to wait in the other countries, you have to wait a bit till it gets better. Um, similar is OpenStreetMap, I don't know if you heard of it um, and we will um, look into it I, I think tomorrow. OpenStreetMap is like Wikipedia for maps, so there's a lot of contributors who, who put features of the map uh, in there and then it's a huge database and I have, like on my smartphone, I have a map of Kiev and it's pretty good and, uh, you, uh, and you can use this data for analysis. You can download it and you can, for example, extract all the schools and all the, all the train stations and so on and relate it to the data that you, the, the individual data that you have. So it's, I think it's the best source to get spatial data. I, I think so far it's in Ukraine. It's uh, it's the the data is good in the bigger cities, but not so much like uh, in the countryside because there are no volunteers who uh, kind of map these smaller cities. But when you have a question relating to Kiev, for example, you can use this data easily. Um, okay. There's this uh, in, in, in the US. You have maps about crimes and about sex offenders and uh, about everything. You can go and use this data as well. Uh, in Switzerland, you can, uh, for example, um, look in, in a publicly available map um, up the, the owner of each building uh, in Switzerland. You can just click on a building and then they say who owns the building. So um, this might be interesting uh, for some research questions. I, I don't think it's possible in Germany and probably not, also not in, uh, in Ukraine. But it's, it's just to show you that there is increasingly like publicly available data that have kind of information about locations and um, it would be sad to not use this, all this data. <coughs> So and um, so this is the this is the one side we have this new data and on the other side we have of course now um, the computational power to analyze this spatial data. Like 20 years ago, it would have it would take like hours and days to calculate like a matrix of 500 by 500. And this is what you need when you have spatial data because you need to calculate distance from each respondent to each respondent. But now it's not so difficult anymore. So increasingly you can use all these possibilities. And um, a lot of these programs are open source, like R and this quantum GIS, 
there's also like commercial programs like ArcGIS, which is like the industry standard, and Stata, of course. Um, but you can go a long way, and, or maybe you can even do more with the open source programs than you can do with the commercial programs. Sometimes the open source programs um, have a steeper learning cor curve, but um, they can do more things. Um, okay, next, potentials. So this is like my last uh, slide for now, and then we go to the, to the we do some hands-on stuff. Uh, okay, so I see potentials for the social sciences uh, from the, uh, arising from this spatial data. Um, first, I think there's, that's probably the easiest, easiest thing, there's the potential of better illustra illustrations when you have like a, a question about Kiev and you show a map of Kiev and you can, uh, you can draw it your own, that's always good to have as an illustration. Um, of course, cartographer, cartographers can do a lot more with maps, and these are these look nicer than we than we can do it. But still, for illustrations in a um, scientific context, it's, I think it's enough. Um, second potential is the potential of new data that is more detailed and more objective. So, usually, uh, oftentimes, we ask in our surveys. Um, where do you live? Do you like it? Uh, are there many foreigners in your neighborhood? And uh, this is very subjective. Yeah, this is how people perceive their neighborhoods. And but you can uh, kind of add subjective data to it, and you can also like ask questions about the the difference between subjective and objective view on the individual neighborhoods. Um, Third potential is the potential of more adequate statistical analysis. When you have special uh, questions, research questions, then you have, for example, special autocorrelations, or you should at least check for it, then you have more adequate statistical analysis. And finally, uh, you, there's, I think, the potential of new research questions. Not only like do the old questions better, but you know, have new questions about spatial dimensions of social processes, about mobility processes, on processes of diffusion, um, and so on and so forth. So this is, I think, a field where you still can be very creative and to really um, do something new. Okay, so far, um, I think we We'll have like five minutes break and then we do something with the GIS, okay?